Before this video begins, I would like to give a quick thank you to my Asbantium level patrons Fallon Cortez and Nathan Gibson. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. Well, here we are at last, the episode you've all been waiting for ever since I started this little review series of mine. When it comes to the 12th Doctor era, one story stands out as particularly significant. It's an episode held in incredibly high esteem, with a ravenous fanbase and almost daily acclaim on Reddit. Dare I say, it's a bit of a hidden gem. Heaven Sent is the spectacular penultimate story of Series 9, trapping the Doctor in this constantly shifting and confusing maze-like prison as he's stalked by a sinister spectre from his own nightmares while trying to process his grief after losing his beloved companion Clara Oswald. Heaven Sent is widely beloved and celebrated, unless you're Harry's move of media. But what is it that makes this story so good? Why is it such a phenomenal exploration of grief whilst also pushing the boundaries of what a Doctor Who story can even be? Well, as always, that's what I'm here to find out. So get your fists of fury ready because it's time to punch through the Asbantian wall that is heaven sent. And yes, this is going to be a very long one. Sorry I'm late. Jumped out of a window. So to understand what makes Heaven Sent so very good, we have to quickly revisit what happened in Face the Raven the episode before. Face the Raven started off much like any other Doctor Who story, a murder mystery where the prime suspect himself was a friend of the Doctor and Clara, sentenced to death via a raven. And no, I'm not talking about the TV show, or that one. No, I mean this raven. What started off as a normal Doctor episode quickly became darker and more twisty as the whole mystery turned out to be a trap to capture the Doctor himself. However, when the villainess Shielder went to remove Rigsy's death sentence, it was revealed that Clara had voluntarily transferred the Chronolock to herself, only to then find out it couldn't be removed from her. This had been Clara's grand plan to prove herself as the Doctor's equal, her way of showing she could come up with all the same clever tricksy schemes her best friend always comes up with. But she had overestimated herself and she ultimately paid the price for it, dying to the Raven after an emotional farewell to the Doctor, who was left helpless and unable to save his platonic soulmate. After her death, as part of a Shielder's agreement to save the street, the Doctor was teleported away, full of anger and guilt for Clara's death, blaming himself and wanting to get revenge on a Shielder for indirectly killing his companion. Companion. And that's where we pick things up in Heaven's Scent, seeing the other side of the teleport as the Doctor arrives in this tube and immediately swears revenge, despite Clara having begged him not to. A big source of criticism for the Moffat era of Doctor Who was how little impact big events seemed to have on characters. A particular example of this was in Series 6, when Amy and Rory's daughter Melody was kidnapped and then revealed to be River Song, with the companions never being able to raise their baby. It was a huge groundbreaking narrative reveal, but the writing didn't really reflect that as Amy and Rory were immediately back to going on adventures as if nothing had changed and they hadn't gone through any sort of grief or trauma. As showrunner, Stephen Moffat was aware of the criticism of these kinds of things. So, you know, he flipped that six upside down and decided to finally explore the more lasting emotional consequences in Series 9, killing off Clara earlier than fans would expect, making her death a lot more effective and unpredictable, along with providing him that narrative space and justification to explore the grief the Doctor feels after losing his best friend, his platonic soulmate. It's unprecedented territory for the show, we didn't really get to see the Doctor grieving after Katarina or Adric. Yes, we saw Eleven grieving after the ponds in the Snowmen, but that was a bit of a background element, whereas this time it's the sole focus. There's no traditional adventure to distract us or the Doctor. Doctor. He just has to confront all his pain and sorrow. Indeed, Heaven Sent is a deep meditation on grief and the pain of losing someone. Moffat wanted to explore this through what's known as a one-hander, and no, that doesn't mean it's a River Song episode. A one-hander is a type of story where the lead actor is essentially the only character in the story, tasked with carrying the entire narrative by themselves with almost no other actors to work off. This is a fantastically inventive approach, highlighting how different the Doctor is when he's truly on his own. It's such a hard style of story to write, having a single speaking role for nearly an entire hour long narrative. After all, how do you avoid that becoming boring or having too many monologues? I think Doctor Who is in the unique position where it's able to find the perfect balance because we're used to the Doctor talking to themselves, especially after an episode like Listen showed us how often the 12th Doctor specifically loves to monologue and speak aloud to thin air, lecturing and theorising when he's on his own. I'm nothing without an audience. I feel like only the Doctor would be able to get away with so much narration and monologuing without things getting boring because of that prior precedent. This is a character that loves to show off and boast about their skills and abilities, always wanting someone around to ask questions for them to answer confidently. I like how they ease us into the idea of only the Doctor speaking, since he starts off speaking aloud to his invisible captors, warning them of his intention for revenge. Clara said, I shouldn't take revenge, you should know. 
I don't always listen. Obviously, it's all good for exposition and broadcasting the Doctor's intentions, but the solo dialogue is the main vessel for the episode's exploration of grief. Twelve rambling about gardeners, Jenny transitions us into these more regular monologues, so we're already used to it by the time he starts explaining his ability to make a telepathic link with a door. Of course, in isolation, it's a typically goofy Moffat thing, like the Doctor being able to understand what babies are saying. But what really makes this moment so important is this line. See, Claire. This singular moment shows us how used to showing off the Doctor has become. There's a similar kind of moment at the start of The Face of Evil, the fourth Doctor talking to companions who aren't there, because it's what this character has become used to. However, the fourth Doctor was voluntarily travelling alone in that story. He had parted from Sarah Jane and then gone through the events of the Deadly Assassin, so he was just kind of doing his own thing on his own accord. But the circumstances of Heaven Sent couldn't be more different. Since the Doctor has had his beloved companion ripped away from him, this singular moment pulling him back down to Earth as he remembers everything he's just lost in the form of Clara, it's that sudden reminder that he doesn't have anyone anymore because he still isn't used to his loneliness. He still expects to have her standing beside him, making a quippy remark and being impressed by his abilities. But she's not, and I love the look on his face as he remembers what has happened. I think it's important to remember just how fresh Clara's death is for the Doctor at this point. Even though for the audience it's been like a week, her death was only a few minutes ago for him, so those wounds are still very much fresh and his emotions raw. The recency of his trauma and the reality of how long ago she died are things brilliantly contrasted by the painting of Clara in one of the rooms, the canvas old and peeling, serving as a stark visual reminder of the companion's death. It also kind of reminds me of the end of the Zygon inversion, the Doctor claiming Clara's absence was the longest month of his life, even if in actuality it was only a few hours. That alone suggested how deep their relationship runs and how strong Strong their bond is. But on top of that, this painting also shows how long it's already been for the Doctor emotionally. Like, yes, she has been physically dead for like 7,000 years by this point because of how the castle works, but on a thematic level, it represents how long it feels for the Doctor, who as a copy has literally just come in from Trap Street. His brain runs so fast that he's already had to spend God knows how long trying to process Clara's death. Additionally, given the nature of the prison, it's clear that an earlier version of the Doctor himself painted the portrait of his platonic soulmate honouring her in a similar way to Rixie's own tribute in Face the Raven. The painting itself is a really powerful visual, it's such a striking and distinctive part of the set design. The Doctor's face upon seeing it says all you need to know, this distant look of pain and regret, along with a bittersweet smile as he remembers the person she was and how much their relationship meant to him. I feel like Peter Capaldi's Twelfth Doctor is the only Doctor a story like this could truly work for, because his personality is tailor-made for Heaven Sent and the themes it explores. Capaldi runs the full gamut of emotions, there's anger and resentment, joy and confidence, but where he truly shines is the heartbreak and quiet suffering. There are so many of these quiet moments where his loneliness dawns on him, Capaldi's non-verbal acting perfectly displaying this broken hero who has lost everything without any sense of closure. Face the Raven had that incredible 10 minute long departure scene for Clara, but it's notable that the companion never really gave the Doctor the chance to say what he wanted to say, reassuring him that she already knew. Heaven Sent shows us how he's internalised those feelings, and every now and then he comes out with something he wanted to say to her, these thoughts here and there voiced into thin air, or spoken to the vision of Clara in his head. I feel like this is a brilliant approach because of how realistic it is. It's common for people grieving and mourning to have these kinds of conversations with the air, imagining that they're still with the person. It's not because the mourner feels like their loved one can actually hear them, it's mainly for their own peace of mind, allowing them to feel like they've at least been able to speak that thought or those feelings to get that closure. So it adds a really nice dimension to the story. One of my favourite instances of this is when the Doctor says this line. You still want me to this, to me, is very reminiscent of Clara speaking to Danny in her dream during Last Christmas, knowing that when she wakes up, he won't be there, so she doesn't want to leave the dream. It shows how hard it is to begin the process of moving on, that constant reminder of how final their death is and how you'll never have that chance to see them again. It's all the days. They stay dead. It's really clever how Heaven Sent focuses on the anti-climax of Clara's death. Yes, her death itself was climactic at the end of Face the Raven, but once she's laying on the cobblestones, that's it. 
nothing changes. The world keeps turning, everyone else's lives keep going, and it's almost as if nothing has changed. Heaven Sent explores that in a really great way, similar to Death in Heaven itself. There's a profound emptiness after the character deaths, and we get to see how that affects the surviving people, because they still have to cope with that loss. It's not like the audience who can just, you know, stop after the credits roll. The Doctor has that great line of the day after the death always being the hardest, and he's completely right. Because the day they die, you can at least be sad, you know, you can go through all those emotions in the moment, but then afterwards, there's just nothing. Everything is empty and you really have to start coming to terms with what happened. The entire episode is the Doctor trying to do this. It's all about him mourning and trying to process this grief he usually just runs away from. Typically, he can just hop back into the TARDIS and go off on another adventure to drown his misery and disguise his grief, but this time, he can't do that because he's trapped here. It's almost like an emotional prison of sorts, and in the behind the scenes, Moffat even refers to this castle as a castle of grief, with the Doctor fighting his way out of loss. Grief is a complicated maze of emotions, constantly shifting and being unpredictable because there's no easy way to just get over it. Overcoming grief will always be a painful, lengthy process, and it's clear how the whole episode is an allegory for this. The Asbantium wall representing the grief and emotional pain and how you have to push through no matter how difficult it is. Speaking of the castle, this creative setting is introduced so well that slow montage of the locations will soon become very familiar with. Marigold's score here is absolutely fantastic, and it all builds up the atmosphere in a delightful way especially with Capaldi's ominous narration of death following you your entire life. This opening becomes even more unsettling when you later realise we're seeing the Doctor's own death, but we'll get to that later. Even without that later context, it's a fascinating establishment of the castle and immediately provides that sense of mystery. The castle itself looks gorgeous with all these suspended corridors and shifting floors moving in such an impossible way. There were more rooms meant to be seen, like the ballroom, but they had to be cut for time. Even so, I simply adore the grandiose look of locations like Room 46. It's this tall, extravagant room with an ornate golden ceiling and stained glass windows giving it a bit of a religious vibe, almost like it's a place of worship. I suppose that itself could be seen as tying into the death and grief themes because the funerals and mourning often take in place in churches. Religious buildings are always often used for meditation and time alone, which makes it fitting for an episode like this since the Doctor is alone in processing his emotions and meditating meditating on his loss. It's a really imaginative setting and it comes to life amazingly, especially when we get the visual of all the floors moving while the Doctor realises just how alone and isolated he really is. Nothing but an endless expanse of water surrounding him. It further restricts the character because there's no escape. There's nowhere for him to swim to, no one to contact or to ask for help. He's well and truly helpless on every level. And few monsters emphasise the Doctor's helplessness more than the Veil, the silent, relentless monster of the episode. I love our first glimpse of this terrifying foe, the Doctor seeing himself on the screen and locating the source as this dark cloaked figure in the window opposite. Without a single word spoken, this monster is immediately established as a creepy and ominous figure, especially when it begins its slow pursuit of our hero, complete with that inhuman sound almost like a roar. I think the Veil is an absolutely inspired piece of Doctor Who design, this figure constantly shambling after the Doctor at the exact same pace. It looks truly impressive in the most terrifying way, such a simple yet effective monster design. It's not some big green alien, it's not some laser wielding creature, it's just this shuffling corpse from the Doctor's own nightmares. This phantom from his childhood seared into his brain forever. I love its long grey hands, how it looks so inhuman as it towers over the Doctor. The white robes leaving a lot to the imagination, especially because it literally has no face when we look at it. I think the veil works so well because it's a one-use monster. This is genuinely the kind of thing that would stick in a child's memory and stay with them, so it has that element of personal realistic horror we can relate to as a viewer. One of my favourite elements of the veil are the flies constantly swarming it, which are scary in their own right, reminding you of the death and decay, but they also announce the creature's presence ahead of time, you know, like heralding it. It could be following you and you have no idea where it is, but then you hear that buzzing or see one of those flies and you know you've got to get out of there, which makes something as simple as a fruit fly very unsettling and terrifying because of what it represents. We also get some fantastic examples examples of this in the episode, like when the Doctor is digging and thoughtlessly slaps away a fly, only for it to lead to that incredible jump scare of the veil appearing. These kinds of moments really escalate the terror of the veil and make it even scarier, because of how quickly and silently it can sneak up on you. 
Another reason the veil is so scary is because it represents death itself. At the beginning, we get that spine tingling speech by the doctor as he describes how death is constantly following you from the moment you're born. No matter how slow it moves towards you, it always maintains the same speed and so it will always catch up with you in the end because you won't be able to outrun it anymore. And this is obviously the main characteristic of the veil in a literal sense, as it relentlessly stalks the doctor from end to end of the castle, never stopping to rest while he has to. It's the one thing the doctor can never outrun, which also kind of draws some parallels to the raven from the episode before, which can also follow its victims to the end of the universe with ease. It's a truly inspired premise for a Doctor Who villain, just straight up death. This grim reaper-like figure slowly and inevitably coming for the Doctor. It's just like he says, one day you'll take too long and death will catch up with you, which is obviously his own inescapable fate within this prison, because no matter what he does, where he goes, the veil always gets to him in the end. I think there's a bit of a sense of the Doctor being kind of like the yin and the yang, the iconic Chinese symbol pretty much everyone knows and has seen at least once. The Doctor explains that every living thing in existence experiences the same two events they can't remember. Those, of course, are the opposites of birth and death, two empirical facts of life that are opposites reliant on one another, just like the yin and the yang themselves. This symbol and its philosophy does doesn't just represent opposites like the sun and the moon or our world and the netherworld. It explores how the opposites are complementary and interconnected, needing one another similar to a symbiotic relationship of sorts. Death happens because we have life. Life is precious because we have death. The Doctor and the Veil are similar in that regard. They are opposites in a way, the Doctor representing life while the Veil represents death. And yet, the Veil only exists because the Doctor does. It's a fascinating dynamic, the only two beings in this entire castle relying on one another for their existence, for their sense of purpose. It's a killer puzzle box designed to scare me to death, and I'm trapped inside it. There's a fantastic moment as the veil seems to corner the Doctor and he has no way out, forced to jump out of the window to escape. At first it seems like an act of desperation, an uncalculated risk, diving into the unknown where he'll surely die. However, it then brilliantly reveals that this was always his plan. He had been calculating the exact conditions the entire time. Even something mundane like dropping pedals on the floor was his way of testing gravity, before then using the chair to work out how far up he really was. I feel like this is a really strong visual representation of how the Doctor is able to constantly think on his feet and plan for anything, because he's always doing these calculations and checking the little details before committing to any actual real risk. And that's what I was alluding to in my Face the Raven review, because Clara doesn't have that kind of ability. She can't employ that kind of tactical and strategic thinking because she's only human. She thought she knew the Doctor enough that she could be him or replicate his approach to plans, but she was too quick to take the chronolock without learning everything about it or thinking of alternative plans to use first. It's a reminder of how different the Doctor is, how much more advanced he is intellectually that his brain can work so rapidly. Even during the fall from the window, he's able to race through all these options and calculate his survival. The whole sequence is fantastically written and shot, providing this look at the Doctor's inner workings as it cuts to him in the safe and familiar setting of the TARDIS. There's a storeroom in your mind. Lock the door and think. This is essentially a mind palace of sorts, a concept Moffat had already explored in his other show Sherlock around the same time. The idea is that when the Doctor is in danger or having to form plans to survive at the last minute, they retreat into their mind like this, giving them the chance to slow things down and calculate their odds of survival. If for the rest of your life, the faster you think, the slower it will pass. However, despite the Doctor having these kinds of superhuman traits allowing him to intellectually tower over us, Heaven Sent makes him so very human and mortal. He's usually the smartest person in the room with a confident swagger and sense of control, but this time he's the only person in the room. He has no control and he's so wrapped up in his grief he loses his superhuman aura. We see this during his first confession to stop the veil, the Doctor admitting he's scared, which is something the character almost never admits to being. Usually he makes the monster scared of him, but it couldn't be more different in this episode. The Doctor has a constant feeling of anxiety because he knows he's always being hunted relentlessly by the silent monster. Heaven sent strips away the armour of the Doctor and shows us the vulnerable person underneath, someone who is still like us despite all his abilities and intelligence. It's similar to Listen again in that regard, taking away all the things we'd usually expect from Doctor Who and instead exploring the Doctor as a person, peeking below the surface to show the fear and crisis of confidence underneath. It's a great example of demystifying the Doctor. It's not anything like a character assassination, it doesn't mock him for being vulnerable. It simply makes him a much more sympathetic and relatable figure, enhancing our relationship with him and adding so many more emotional layers to the Doctor as a legendary character. And if you want to be a legendary character, you know, just hit that like and subscribe button. I, I will admit I hate having to say that, but it is what it is, so you do that. 
This Mind Palace concept also serves as a way of showing how Twelve can still feel as though he's interacting with Clara, thanks to this manifestation of her in his mind. When she was alive, Clara was the Doctor's conscience. Much like any other companion, she was there to ask questions and appreciate his brilliance, but she also pushed him to be the best he could be. She helped him grapple with his dilemma of being a good man. She helped him save Gallifrey. She helped transform Twelve from the cold, morally questionable man of Series 8 into the more jovial and lovingly grumpy man of Series 9. Despite the toxicity and codependence of their relationship, Clara really did get the best out of Twelve, and we see that in these scenes, as his imaginary Clara constantly pushes him to keep going, to not only survive, but to win. Do I have to know everything? She had an undying faith in the Doctor. She knew he would never give up on her, and she would never give up on him. So it speaks a lot to her impact on him and his deep feelings for her that he can still lean on her even after she dies. She's not physically there anymore, but the Doctor can still rely on Clara and trust her to push him on, to keep him going even in his darkest hour and his lowest moments. He's always asking for her input, even when she's not there. What do you think, Clara? Someone trying to give me a hint? What would you do? Not only is it another way to justify the Doctor always talking to himself throughout this episode, it also builds up that idea of their relationship, how he's almost become reliant on her in a sense. Indeed, throughout Series 8 and 9, the Doctor needed Clara more and more to keep him going and to give him something to fight for, you know, as a tether to humanity. So it's a nice touch as we see him almost internalising her in a way, allowing her to represent the best of him like he always believed she was. It's a touching way for the character to remember his lost companion, keeping her with him and honouring her memory by making her a part of him, literally turning her into his conscience to keep him going and supporting him no matter what, just like she did when she was alive. When it came to assigning the director of Heaven Sent, Moffat immediately turned to Rachel Talale, who had knocked out of the park with a very impressive and cinematic Series 8 finale. I absolutely adore Talale's work on this episode, and she manages to outdo herself with confidence and ease. Moffat tasked her with making the episode beautiful, distinctive and scary, and she fully embraced Embrace that challenge. It's such a beautiful episode. Talale was inspired by the movie The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, so she creates all these hard shadows throughout the corridors, allowing you to constantly see the looming spectre of the veil from a distance. Talale also intentionally made those shadows not make much sense to drive people crazy, with the light seeming to come from completely different directions, which makes it all very confusing and adds a very surreal atmosphere to the lighting and the shot composition. Talale has so many different ideas for shots, and they all fit perfectly. From the fisheye lens of the Veil's point of view, to all the Dutch angles and shaky cam, it successfully creates that distinctive feeling Moffat wanted the director to aim for. I genuinely think that Heaven Sent is one of the most visually gorgeous and striking episodes in the entire show. Obviously it has Doctor Who's usual budget limitations for stuff like CGI, but Talale is so creative with her lighting and direction. The different areas of the castle all have distinct visuals, like the foggy graveyard-like courtyard and the dining room bathed in orange sunset. It genuinely looks so cinematic and impressive, creating such an amazing atmosphere and tone for the episode as a whole. I think it's another prime example of Talale's love and dedication to the filmmaking that she went to the effort of sketching the structures and the layout of the castle on each page of the script, allowing for her and the crew to visualise where exactly the Doctor is in any given scene and how to set those scenes up. It's these kinds of touches that set Talale apart from most other directors in the world, because she thinks about those extra details and takes them into account to make the episode the best it could possibly be. This is also apparent of how Talale worked directly with Capaldi throughout the production. The two were close, so during the filming of Heaven Sent, they were constantly communicating their thoughts on the complexity of the script, working together to reach a shared vision and understanding. It's a really important thing for directors to be able to do, having this sense of common ground and elevating each other's strengths. Capaldi and Talale know how to get the best out of one another, and that really shows in this episode at so many points. From the depths of the water to the castle turrets, there's a lovely sense of variation, and Capaldi's Doctor manages to fit perfectly into all of them, naturally adjusting for whatever tone or visual Talale wants to implement. I love the visual of the Doctor underwater, firstly with the TARDIS Mind Palace booting up to show him regaining consciousness, but then there's also that sight of hundreds of thousands of skulls submerged. At first, it's quite peaceful in 
in a way, especially because of the 12th Doctor's theme. Those audio twinkles or whatever you'd call them. The Doctor just wants rest, he just wants to give in. But then there's that sudden musical sting as he sees the skulls, you know, it immediately jerks him back into reality and reminds us of the seriousness of his situation. That fundamental need to survive kicking in. The skulls are another thing that become a lot more horrifying with a later context because, you know, they're all the Doctor. Obviously some of these will have fallen from the tower later on like we see, but a lot of them would literally be previous versions of 12 who didn't make it out of the water, either dying from the impact itself or allowing himself to succumb to the warm embrace of death, giving in to that desire to just sleep. Also, yes, I guess there were a few times where the Doctor didn't have a freshly dried set of clothes ready, so he'd be running around in his birthday suit. You're welcome for that mental image. Heaven Sent has such a magnificently methodical build up. The pacing is so deliberately slow but in the best way possible as we're introduced to all these mysteries one by one, gradually building a picture of where the Doctor is and what's going on. A prime example of this is as 12 finds that fresh set of clothes, the orchestral score swelling as we see it's absolutely identical, things like this and the painting start to establish the idea of everything in the castle being personalised for the Doctor in some sense. The mystery deepens when he sees that declaration, I am in 12. Yeah, you know, Missy wishes. Jokes aside, this gives the Doctor a new purpose, a new goal. He doesn't just have to survive now, he has somewhere to actually find something to look for. It comes about 25 minutes into the episode, so it helps to keep the pacing interesting and add variation while still only gradually revealing things to us. So it's a great example of the strong pacing of such a slow burn story. I think the music is also a big part of this. Murray Gold has stated that the episode was his favourite to score since the Pandorica opens and that really shows. With 14 incredible tracks on the soundtrack, Heaven Sent has its own distinct soundscape. You have the slow ambient build of A Second Shadow, then the dreadfield track The Veil, which starts off gradual reflecting the plodding rhythmic footsteps of the villain before growing more intense with violins, creating a traditionally horror feeling until it results in that cacophony of frenzy that gives way to bittersweet melancholy orchestra, and I think that melancholy is the core tone of the scores, this persistently haunted music always following the Doctor, who Gold describes as being a mix between Sisyphus and Theseus in a perpetual mission to cheat death. Every track on the Heaven Sent OST perfectly serves its purpose to build the atmosphere. It's foreboding and dreadfilled when it needs to be, with tracks like A Mechanical Maze and Waiting for the Veil using a lot of those horror violins, but then the music will transform into frantic, kinetic orchestral scores with a sense of intense and adrenaline, almost becoming like a John Williams soundtrack. You get emotional scores like Same Old Day, the adventurous determination of Break Free, which adapts the 12th Doctor's theme, and then you have some tracks using 80s synths like A Fly on a Painting and Tell No Lies, very different sounds to other New Who tracks, with the latter track even using an accordion with like western vibes, indicating this eccentric standoff between the Doctor and the Veil. Throughout all the tracks there's also the same leitmotif constantly revisited, present on almost every piece, and I think that helps to indicate the infinity of the prison, how repetitive the Doctor's life has become as he tries to escape. Murray Gold's work across the episode is truly sublime and it really does deserve recognition even outside of The Shepherd's Boy. I love the shock at the beginning as the Doctor opens a locked door just to see that big concrete wall. The realisation he's completely trapped with a veil right behind him, perfectly emphasised by Murray Gold's score. I can't actually see a way out of this. The scene has a bit of a meta inside joke about the Doctor finally running out of corridors, and that is a fun touch, especially given Moffat's own jokes about corridors back in The Curse of Fatal Death. However, what I love the most about this moment is how much it represents the Doctor's mentality after losing Clara. He is trapped with no way out, he doesn't know what to do with himself, he's struggling to process his trauma and he's at his lowest point, with no way out of this depression. I'm actually scared of dying. This moment is such a fantastic turn of events. The Doctor managed to save his own life by admitting his fears of death. First of all, it's one of those rare glimpses at the person underneath, but secondly, it's that first indication this is a tailor-made torture prison for the Doctor. The veil stops completely still, even all the flies freeze in midair. It's immediately obvious that the Doctor can somehow influence the mechanics of this castle, and that becomes clearer throughout as his confessions are the key. I have to tell truths I've never told before. This creates a really interesting dynamic between the Doctor and the villain, the monster itself preying on his vulnerabilities. Each time he gets caught by the veil, the Doctor has to reveal another secret. 
exposing one more part of him every single time. Ever since the very beginning, the Doctor has held deep secrets the audience has never been privy to. His family, his past, even his name have all been withheld from us to create a mysterious allure about the character. It's part of the Doctor's very essence in universe and out, you know, the show is literally called Doctor Who. So forcing the Doctor into this position of needing to give up his deep secrets is almost like stripping him of his sense of self and identity. It's absolutely incredible this character exploration of the Doctor, who, like I mentioned, suddenly seems so very human and mortal. I love the realisation of why there are all the screens broadcasting the Veil's location at every given moment. Because it's trying to scare me. It's an intimidation tactic, further cementing that idea of it being a personalised torture chamber. When the Doctor discovers the courtyard with a big mound of soil and a conveniently placed spade, he knows it's time to dig like a left-leaning Twitter user during an argument. The visual almost looks like the Doctor digging his own grave, with the darkness and fogginess of the scene really making it look spooky and like a graveyard. It's symbolic of how the episode is about those concepts like death and grief. As dusk shifts to night, the music adds a profound sense of loneliness to the scene, the piano emphasising the Doctor's vulnerability, especially as he looks up to the stars. Oh no, that's not right. Rarely have we ever seen the Doctor so out of his depth, so fragile and lost. When he first arrived at the castle, he was driven by his determination for revenge, knowing that the moment he could see the stars, he'd be able to identify exactly where and when in the universe he is. But now, he doesn't even have that. As the Doctor stands in this literal pit, his isolation and helplessness really begins to dawn on us, and he suddenly seems smaller than ever, which is another great example of visual storytelling, perfectly matching those narrative themes within the script. Once the Doctor realises this is a prison with no escape, he's forced to explore every inch of the castle and measure exact times and distances so he can understand how far away the Veil is and how long he can spend doing any given activity like eating, sleeping and working. This again highlights the very analytical nature of the Doctor, especially in this 12th incarnation. It's a great montage as he tests the boundaries of his confinement, akin to the Prisoner or the Truman Show. I like the Doctor's little notebook mapping out the rooms of the castle, and doodles like the exterior and the skulls. I don't know if it was Capaldi himself who drew these, or whether it was Rachel Talale or someone else, since you know those two do love doing doodles, but regardless it helps to build a sense of familiarity with the setting as the Doctor spends more and more time there, becoming so intimately familiar with every nook and cranny. As a viewer, it communicates just how much time is passing. He's not doing all this within the first few hours there. This is a process that likely takes days and days as he searches for room 12, with the castle tidying itself over time, resetting rooms to how they were when he arrived at the beginning. I feel like this adds to the hellish isolation of it all. No matter what the Doctor does, he can't leave a mark on this place. There's no sense of permanence. You can't change a room to how you like it. You can't strategically move things around or build traps for the veil. You're nothing more than a prisoner in every sense of the word. Eating basic meals, only able to sleep for like half an hour at a time. It's a crippling feeling of uselessness and isolation, perfectly shown through the visuals and the sheer incredible acting of Capaldi. But how long will I have to be here? It's delightfully bittersweet as the Doctor stumbles across Room 12 at long last, only to realise it's locked behind the castle's configuration. He spent all that time searching, only to have his potential salvation ripped out of his grasp. And of course, as Capaldi's face shows, the Doctor knows the only way to access it is to confess again. Like he says, it's a trap. He has to sacrifice another part of his identity to get inside the room, further twisting the knife of this torture and interrogation. This is somebody's game. I can't stop playing. I really love how the moment transitions the Doctor's face into the skull he found in the first room. Even on its own, it's a creepy and memorable transition, but it becomes extra unsettling when you later realise this is the Doctor's own face, especially because the skull was modelled on Capaldi's own. It's a chilling piece of foreshadowing, showing you how the only way he can escape is to die. He can't game the system, there's no cheating or technicalities he can rely on like usual. He just has to follow this pre-planned trail of breadcrumbs and give up the truths as he goes. There's a great musical stinger as the Doctor notes the stars are in the wrong positions, distracted by this mystery as the veil sneaks up on him. Something I love about this moment is how it builds that uneasiness, making us feel like the Doctor is staying in the same place too long, like the narration at the beginning suggested. It tricks you into thinking he's not paying attention, only for him to have known exactly where the veil was the whole time. After all, he needs it to catch him so he can open room 12, so it's a brilliant moment of subversion as he casually waits for it to reach towards his face before swaggering around and making his confession about knowing exactly what the hybrid is. 
The hybrid is obviously the big story arc of Series 9, introduced in Episode 1 and referenced throughout the series as we get indications towards this old Gallifreyan legend, a prophecy of a creature standing in the ruins of Gallifrey as the hybridisation of two great warrior races. After its introduction in the opening story, it took a bit of a backseat throughout the series, but it's nice to see it come back up here again at the forefront. The main confession the Doctor is dancing around during the story, and you know, reminding you how important this is and how big this secret is ahead of Hellbent. When the Doctor finally enters Room 12, we get some absolutely glorious shots, once again showing the value of Talele and her directing vision. Like I mentioned earlier, the whole episode is beautifully filmed. There's something about the shining light of the Asbantian wall that really kicks things into overdrive, taking the entire visual direction up a notch. And indeed, this is a wall made out of pure Asbantium, a fictional mineral 400 times stronger and harder than diamond. There's an absolutely brilliant bombshell moment as the Doctor finally understands the meaning of bird, the single word he saw earlier written in the sand. I love how the perspective and depth of field changes here, everything stretching out behind the Doctor to emphasise the gravity of the situation. After all, he now understands exactly what he has to do, either confess or punch his way out until he dies, repeating the same cycle over and over again for infinity. Why is it always me? Why is it never anybody else's turn? I really appreciate the raw emotion and anger from Capaldi here, the Doctor furious that he has to put himself through these things. Just for once, he's desperate to lose, because he has no fight left in him. It's interesting how he says this after the girl who died, when he already claimed to almost always lose, because of the people he loses. I'm so sick of losing. When someone is in great emotional pain, there's always that inner voice telling them to just give in, to lose and take the easy way out. That's the state the Doctor is in here, wanting things to just be easy for once. It's that sense of selfishness we often see creeping in, whether that be the Time Lord Victorious, the 8th Doctor into the death, or the 12th Doctor right here. There's always that temptation to serve himself, to take the easy route and get what he wants, even if that means losing. And you'll still be gone. This moment is again an emotional masterclass by Peter Capaldi. There's just something so raw and real as the Doctor sinks down, overcome with grief and emotion. He's been distracting himself with the mystery of the veil in the castle, but now he remembers exactly what he lost, and it makes him wonder why he's even bothering, because he has nothing left to fight for. The Doctor has lost the most important person to him in arguably the most unfair way possible, and now he just wants to give up, because either way he loses. However, it's here that Clara is able to save the Doctor, again despite being dead. I mentioned before that he creates this vision of sorts, Clara residing within his mind palace and influencing his actions. However, this was done using a chalkboard in the back of her body, so we never saw her face or heard her speak. It was a masterful way to create a sense of distance, reminding us that this Clara isn't real, just a coping mechanism for the Doctor. But when 12 is truly at its absolute lowest point of the episode, this happens. Doctor. You are not the only person who ever lost someone. I love this moment, not just as a fan of this duo, but also because of how well it works narratively. After all that grief, all that mourning, we finally see Jenna Coleman's face, giving the Doctor that reassurance and confidence to pick himself up and win. The moment worked so well because the Clara vision was so impersonal before, so detached and mannequin-like. Therefore, seeing the real Clara here comes as a huge surprise and makes it a really powerful moment. It's also a moment that reminds me of Dark Water, where the Doctor gave his companion that rousing speech after Danny died, inspiring her to keep her chin up because it's the darkest hour, the time where she really needs to prove herself and show what she's made of. And this moment is much the same, but with the shoe on the other foot. Like Clara says, it's time for the Doctor to pick himself up and win, even if that comes at the cost of his own life for billions of years, because it's the only solution, the only way to be the Doctor. I love the moment as the Doctor literally picks himself up, gaining the resolve to start punching the Asbantian wall towards his freedom. I see it as the acknowledgement that there is no easy way out. You have to go through the pain to get to the other side and move on. Not only would confessing the truth of the hybrid go against the Doctor's personal morals, it would also represent giving up and taking the easy route rather than processing his trauma and recovering the hard way. I think this is also why the Doctor doesn't try using the spade rather than his hands, something a lot of fans have questioned and pointed as a plot hole. I mean, actually, first of all, there's no way for him to go back and get the spade, because by the time he's recovered his confidence, the veil has already blocked the entrance. But even on a thematic level, it would be cheating in a sense. Like I said, he needs to push through the pain to recover and gain his physical and emotional freedom. To use the spade would be to cut corners, 
rather than processing the grief in the way he needs to. The punching of the wall is another example of Capaldi's incredible acting. He genuinely makes it seem like he's in real pain with every punch, setting the agony and torment of each hit, each reaction working so well because of, you know, the scrunched up face, the wincing and gritted teeth as he tries to push away the agonizing pain in his arm. If you've ever punched a wall or, you know, like a locker or any kind of surface for that matter, you'll know it hurts. Now imagine a wall 400 times harder than diamond, the hardest natural substance on our planet and something that is almost indestructible even a single punch could break your fingers, your hand, or, or your wrist. And here the doctor is an elderly man striking it repeatedly, no matter how hard it hurts him because he knows he's already dead. It really highlights the resolve and determination of the Doctor, putting himself through this immense pain because he knows that eventually one of his future selves won't have to and will finally be free. It's the most selfless act of selfishness you could ever see, the Doctor sacrificing himself for himself. Indeed, the Doctor realises that he has been here for a very long time already, so his only way out is to lay the foundation for the next Doctor to build upon, punching this wall that so many others would have already punched before him. In a way, he becomes a cog in the machine, which is fitting because there are so many shots of the castle's cogs and gears throughout the episode. He's just one part in a much larger chain, never being able to see the freedom himself, but at least being able to ensure his next one is even a little bit closer. The Doctor explains this process through the the story of The Shepherd's Boy, a fairy tale written by Ludwig Arbacher and published by the Brothers Grimm, German folklore writers who popularise stories like Snow White, Cinderella, Little Red Riding Hood, Hansel and Gretel and Sleep and Beauty. Yeah, so they're basically responsible for Disney ever existing to begin with. However, unlike those happy-go-lucky Disney adaptations, the Grimm fairy tales, rather fittingly, have very dark elements and twists, such as Cinderella's doves pecking out the eyes of her stepsisters as revenge. You know, just girl boss things. And that's just one of the Disney examples. I won't even say what happens in the robber bridegroom, especially because I want to stay monetized. The Shepherd's Boy, in contrast, is Sunshine and Roses, a simple story about a boy who became famous for all the wise answers he gave to every single question. Indeed, the king brings him to him and asks him impossible questions, such as how many drops of water there are in the ocean and how many stars there are in the sky, only for the boy to craftily answer them with impossible requests, like asking the king to dam up every river on earth so he can count, or covering a paper in so many dots it's impossible to count, and then claiming that it's the same amount as there are stars in the sky, you know, you just have to count them for proof. The third question is the one explored in Heaven Sent, with the king asking how many seconds there are in infinity. Again, the question is impossible, and yet the boy is still able to answer it wisely, with an explanation of the bird chiseling a diamond mountain. Obviously the titular Shepherd's Boy is similar to the Doctor as a character, a crafty and resourceful person who can wisely dance his way around the impossible, coming up with these clever answers and using technicalities, kind of like with some of the Doctor's confessions where he doesn't actually give them what they want. That's the kind of intelligence we've seen the Doctor display countless times. However, the reason I wanted to mention this context of the story isn't just because it's a great literal example of what the Doctor is doing here, it's also kind of relevant to Hellbent too. As a reward for his three answers, the King allows the boy to live within his royal palace and promises to regard him as his own son. This, of course, is kind of like when the Doctor is rewarded with Gallifrey, the chance to return home and be embraced as a son of the Time Lords, only for him to refuse. Obviously, we don't know whether the Shepherd's Boy accepted or declined the King's offer, but I just find it an interesting added touch when it comes to this fairy tale being used in this episode's climax. There's a wonderfully chilling visual as the veil finally claims the Doctor, those long creepy fingers blocking his view of his freedom and burning his face, killing him. It's a shocking thing to see, especially after seeing the Doctor escape so many life or death situations. It's not even like a regeneration, this is more of a traditional death communicated by the Doctor explaining how he's too injured to regenerate, but his body is still trying. It's impossible to imagine the kind of pain he's experiencing on his long, agonising trip back to their teleportation chamber. A day and a half of crawling and dragging himself through this endless pain as his body slowly dies on him. It's a really sobering and shocking way to see the Doctor, so broken and defeated, yet still forcing himself onwards for a greater purpose. Like I said, it's the most selfless act of selfishness. He's doing all of this in a knowledge that he himself will never get to see that freedom because he's going to die for good. He's a copy of the Doctor, replacing the previous copy and proceeding the next. They all stem from the exact same starting point, and yet their identities are still as valid as the original Doctor's. So each time, the Doctor is quite literally dying. 
The transmat device creating copies of the Doctor is a concept Moffat had come up with as far back as the 1980s, and he almost used it for a Big Finish audio story. So you know, imagine that parallel universe. I love how the idea is explored in Heaven Sent, with the Doctor dying and being recreated billions upon billions of times in this attempt to escape. It's one of the most heroic things the Doctor has ever done in any incarnation, because it's that pure sacrifice with no regeneration or guarantee of success. How could there be other prisoners in my hell? I love how Murray Gold's music builds to a crescendo as the Doctor's life ebbs away. Even in his mind palace he falls down, no longer able to even hold himself up. I think it's one of the darkest moments in Doctor Who history, as we realise the scenes from the very beginning of the episode were actually the previous version of the Doctor burning himself up to print this one. Now that we see the process in its entirety, we really get that terrifying sense of how many times he has to have done this, burning himself up time and time again for at least 7,000 years. There's something so macabre about it all, seeing him setting everything up for his replacement, his last action being to painfully scrawl out the bird as that hint. I think it's also quite fitting as the Doctor questions how long he can keep burning the old him to make a new one. Obviously that has a very literal meaning in this episode, but it's also very thematic in the sense that this is a sentence that defines the Doctor as a person, with regeneration itself burning up the last incarnation to herald in the new. It's the kind of thing Twice Upon a Time also touches upon, with the Doctor too tired to want to regenerate again, desperate for the rest he believes death could grant him. After all, despite the Doctor's form and personality changing, it's still the same person underneath, with all the same memories, personalities and suffering. After a while that would just become agonising, like we've seen with Captain Jack and a shielder, who want to die. Immortality is the sharpest double-edged sword imaginable, forcing you to watch everyone you love get the permanent rest you can never have. Indeed, the Doctor just has to keep on going, even if that's not always what he wants for himself. Because that's the price of being a hero. Get up off your ass and win. Of course, it's then that the most memorable part of the episode kicks in, Murray Gold's Shepherd's Boy music ramping up as we see that montage of the process, the entire thing shortened to give us that idea of repetition. The Shepherd's Boy is one of Gold's all-time best tracks. It takes you on this long musical journey, focusing on the strings and that amazing melody. Of course, this theme was actually originally in the Day of the Doctor OST, but it was clearly too good to not reuse in some capacity, and I think it's what makes this montage work so well. It begins slow, almost swaying in a sense. With each repeat of the loop, it gradually speeds up with more instruments coming in. I think it really helps to emphasise that lengthy time of the process, reminding you just how long it takes the Doctor. It's not like it takes him just a few years to punch through the wall, it takes him millions to even make a little tiny dent. It's amazing how editing and music can unlock a scene like this. If it had any other track playing or was edited any differently, it could fall completely flat, but it works so perfectly here. There's so much variation in the shots, the sound effects and the music that it feels more like a journey forward rather than a recap of what we've already seen. After all, it's not a time loop, it's not like Groundhog Day, it's a slow progression further and further into the future. And that's reflected wonderfully thanks to Moffat and Talale, who filmed different variations of the shots to communicate how it's not identical. This sense of progression is also shown as the Doctor manages to complete more and more of his story. While the music grows louder and faster, the editing more frantic each time. It's this true Truly sublime build, time speeding up into the dramatic and bombastic crescendo, making it all feel so triumphant as the music perfectly leads into the Doctor finally breaking the wall with a loud cathartic shout. It's such an inventive and incredible way to provide a thrilling climax to an episode like this, which you know is purely character based and so methodical. It's not a traditional Doctor Who climax, there's not a big dramatic fight and chase scene. In fact, it's probably the slowest chase in Doctor Who history, taking place over 4 billion years before the Doctor can finally escape, his foe exploding into lifeless cogs and suddenly looking a lot less scary. I feel like this ending montage is a big reason the episode is so beloved. Not only does it have that excitement factor of the music and the editing, but it also pays off the slow build and the mystery of the wider episode. We've been on this long journey with the Doctor as he's explored the castle and started punching the wall. We've been there as the mystery has slowly unfurled and blossomed like a flower. Once we've worked out what's going on and the Doctor has explained to us exactly how this is all working, this montage gives us that big dramatic reward of zooming out and showing us just how small the episode was in the wider scheme allowing us to enjoy the loop twist to its full extent and reach the ending alongside the Doctor himself. Personally, I think that's a hell of a bird. When the Doctor first saw the Asbantian Wall, he assumed the TARDIS was on the other side, which I think speaks to what he truly considers home. 
Despite being born and raised on Gallifrey, he's rarely ever considered it his home, especially after the Timeless became so villainous and destructive thanks to the Time War. Indeed, the Doctor considers the TARDIS his home because it's his safe place, his longest and most loyal companion. However, despite the Doctor running away, Gallifrey is still undeniably his home, which is why it's fantastic that the episode culminates in 12 arriving on the surface of the planet he thought was lost forever. Indeed, the whole castle prison was simply his confession dial, obviously using Time Lord technology to make it bigger on the inside. It's a brilliant reveal, finally explaining what the dial is and how it works. Of course, it's Hellben that outright explains the dial is used as purification, helping a dying Time Lord to face any demons they have in order to make peace and purify themselves so they can be uploaded to the Matrix. Naturally, the villainous Time Lords repurpose that into a torture chamber, which kind of suggests to me that they never planned for the Doctor to escape, even if he did confess. The ending of Heaven Sent is one of the biggest cliffhangers in New Who history as the camera pans to show that iconic visual of the Gallifrey and Citadel, the bombshell reveal of Gallifrey itself for the first time since Day of the Doctor. By the end of that episode, the Doctor has seemed to have overcome a lot of his negative feelings towards his own planet and its people, excited to find it again once he realised it wasn't destroyed. However, after being put through everything with Clara and the confession dial, 12 is a lot less excited to be back, and it's kind of hard to blame him. All they had to do was, you know, just phone him or something. They didn't have to set up a plan to torture him for four and a half billion years, along with indirectly killing his companion to, you know, really piss him off. And of course, if Gallifrey's return itself isn't enough of a bombshell, we finally see the Doctor revealing the truth of the hybrid. It's me. I think this is really interesting and probably the single reason Series 9 has a shielder going by the name of me, because it casts doubt on what exactly the Doctor means by this. Obviously we're later to find out that he literally does mean himself because of him and Clara, but the name along with a shielder being in the next time trailer creates the ambiguity and it is pretty clever, albeit a bit moffaty in a sense. But even still, Heaven Sent is an episode that ends just as strongly as the narrative was throughout, giving you a fantastic bombshell tease to make you really want to tune in for the finale, meaning it really succeeds as a penultimate episode. If there is any lingering doubt, I absolutely adore Heaven Sent. It's by far one of the greatest episodes of Doctor Who ever made. Hell, I'd even say it's one of the best episodes of any show ever. It masterfully tackles deep themes like grief and mourning, while pushing the boundaries of Doctor Who with an episode completely stripping away everything you thought you knew and expected from the franchise. The whole story takes place in this beautiful castle setting, which itself is an excellent thematic device, this endlessly shifting maze representing the Doctor's own complex emotions as he tries to deal with Clara's death. The directing and music are phenomenal, bringing everything to life and telling a story on its own, even without needing the incredible dialogue from Capaldi, who acts his heart out despite having nobody to play off. Moffat's script hits new heights, with so many wonderful moments exploring the Doctor as a character. The Veil is a brilliant antagonist, this silent and sinister monster with amazing design, although I don't like how expanded media tried to make it some misunderstood friendly force. Anyway, if you didn't already somehow guess, Heaven Sent gets a shining, sparkling S rank on the Series 9 tier list. In fact, alongside Midnight, you'd probably get, you know, like an S plus rank. It's that good. There's so much to dissect in this episode, literally every element is top notch. It's one of the most high concept Doctor episodes in its illustrious history, and it never drags. It keeps you on the edge of your seat the whole time, with this gripping intense character story showing you the deeper layers of the Doctor and perfectly set in the climactic stage for the series finale. Heaven Sent absolutely deserves the high praise it often gets from fans. It's a tour de force and an absolutely incredible success on every level. I'm sure you already agree, but if you didn't, I hope hope I managed to change your mind. Either way, thank you very much for watching if you still are. This was a massive video and you know if you liked it please comment, like, subscribe, share it around, all that kind of usual stuff. I don't like saying it but it does boost engagement. So you know I, I just really appreciate you all watching my dumb videos online and I really hope you enjoyed this one. And as always I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye. And I'd just like to thank my Asbantium level patrons, Fallon Cortez and Nathan Gibson, my Diamond level patron, Glenn O'Clock, my Platinum level patrons, Maximilian Foreman and Nix Games, and all my Gold level patrons, Boots, Daniel Shiloto, Franzorn aka Line Vortex, Robert Hock, and Tom Azar. Thank you so much for your support.